Hello, and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in banking. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. While we are not seeing the end of banking, we are observing a change of the guard in financial services. Powered by a deluge of funding, fintech firms are altering the battlefield for customers and relationships. Without quick and decisive action, legacy financial institutions could become invisible to consumers and small businesses by as early as 2030. To a degree, this has already occurred in payments. So what's next? We are very fortunate to have Philip DeBacker and Juan Gonzalez from the firm Arthur D. Little on the show today. They will discuss the challenges facing traditional banking organizations and the actions that must be taken today for long-term survival. Philippe and Juan, in your book, Disruption, The Future of Banking and Financial Services, How to Navigate and Seize the Opportunities, you make a case that the future of banking may not include the names of the banks that we've become so familiar with unless significant changes are made by traditional financial institutions quickly. What makes such a dismal future even possible at a time when virtually every legacy bank is making money? So, uh, Jim, l let me start by uh, addressing it. The, the dismal uh, outlook is really an, a description of fundamental changes, this set of discontinuities, not that the industry itself uh, is said to be uh, doom and gloom. The challenge will be for different market participants to align their strategy, uh, their uh, model the capabilities in order to basically uh, address how to pick my, the right battle for me and, and how to win within the space. So Philippe, as you and your team are developing the premise and plan of action going forward for your book, what changed as a result of the pandemic? The pandemic essentially accelerated. Um, it was a tipping point but it was not a discontinuity. It might be, have been a psychological discontinuity in a number of, uh, of people's minds, but fundamentally, uh, things have been in the making for a very long time. And we have seen, for instance, the advent of a uh, new distribution model, the advent of technology being applied in, the, in a competitive manner for now almost a, a decade. Therefore, this pandemic serves more as a catalyst than uh, a real driver of change. So, so Juan, what stood out from your perspective as the most important trend that is changing banking as we know it today? I think there's a, it comes from a long time back, uh, which is the fact that uh, customers are losing trust in, in traditional financial institutions. And that financial institutions tend to see the problem from, with their eyes from the point of view rather than, than a customer's point of view. So what we see is the emergence of new players who are not banks by the technical definition of banks, but who provide services that customers realize that serve as a adequate substitutes for services that banks used to provide. So that, that uh, they, can, they can provide payment services, they can provide uh, savings, they can provide uh, credit, they can provide many of the different services that banks used to provide in a different way and in a way that is much more attuned to customer preferences. And that's a slowly uh, eroding the trust that, that clients had in, in, in banks uh, in the past because they see that things can be done differently. And uh, that, that transformation is, is very slow, uh, but at the same time very powerful. So, so Juan, from your perspective then, it's not like the banks have lost trust because they're not trustworthy. They've lost trust because they haven't kept up with the needs of the consumer? Uh, that's exactly the point. To me, it's banking is essential. Banks are not essential. And they have, uh, many banks have not realized that the function is essential, but the way they provide it is not exactly uh, the one that is needed. Also, the, uh, the uh, big financial crisis of the late uh, 2008 to 2009 has not helped banks create an impression of, of being the trusted advisor that they had to be. So they have burned a lot of, of uh, brownie points in the process. So, Philippe, some of the key imperatives you mentioned in your book is that digital transformation at speed, finding the right leadership, and the role of technology and importance of innovation are all major components of the future. 
Which component do you believe is the most important for survival if you were to prioritize those? As you correctly highlighted, obviously there are a number of drivers and there's no silver bullet. However, there's one common denominator, um, which basically is uh, capabilities, but more specifically, uh, the ability to lead during this transformation and goes back to, to management and the leadership in management. And that leadership is essentially a required alignment between the board, the C-suite and the rest of the organizations so in order for all the other elements that drive this change uh, to be uh, to be aligned and fall into place. But it starts with the CEO. It's leading from the top, having the vision, the courage to pick their battle and just apply it you know, uh, systematically with the support of the board. So Philippe, if, if the leadership may not be right, can you invest your way out of the problem? In other words, can the investment in technology offset maybe leadership that's somewhat unwilling to change? Or really is the, the leadership really the key component you need even more than just a lot of money being spent on, on technology? If you've misaligned your strategy, if you have the wrong um, business model, revenue model, um, you cannot you know, throw money at the problem. It, you cannot try to solve uh, some uh, fundamental business and strategic issues through a silver bullet called technology. We've seen the failure of that in, in previous decades with um, CRM uh, that failed to deliver on the promise, not because the technology was at fault, but because institutions were incapable of leveraging that technology within their business model. Uh, you can always, you can also look at, at uh, new entrants as, as the disruptors. Many of them have amazing technologies. Most of them will not make it. So it's, technology on its own is not going to be the, the road to riches. Uh, it's definitely required. Uh, you cannot play with all technologies in, in next generation metaverse or, or however, whatever world we're going to move into. Data is going to be at the center, but technology on its own is not going to, to be uh, the road to, to riches. You know, it's interesting. Technology almost becomes the entry point. That is the, the, the what you have to have good technology to support everything else. But all these other elements come into play. I was I was fortunate enough to be in Shenzhen, China and visiting uh, uh, WeBank back in uh, January of 2020. And it was interesting. Yes, they had some amazing technology. They run four parallel cloud platforms at the same time. But one thing that really st stood out was their focus on innovation and how important very quick iterative innovation was. You know, I'm wondering one is how important is the ability to not innovate the big thing, the, the, the silver bullet, but really, really being able to innovate on an iterative basis as quickly as possible. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, to, to me, the, the, that's the most important uh, element in a strategy these days, in, in a world of changing customer requirements, changing customer preferences, a quick, uh, entrance coming from anywhere, everywhere uh, to, to your uh, traditional domains, your ability to adapt becomes the, the fundamental capability. So it's not that, that uh, you, can, you can set a course and say, let's, let's move uh, steadily along this prototype uh, that we have devised, but rather uh, the ability to, to realize quickly that things are changing and uh, to come back with uh, additional uh, solutions to what customers uh, or competitors propose. Uh, you see, the, the, it's not only banking, it's, it's the trend that we are seeing in every uh, business that is uh, facilitated by technology. Yeah. So the, the value of the new cloud players is not in, in the cost that they provide, but rather their ability to provide new services. The value that, that we're finding in e-commerce uh, is the variety and the speed that, that they adjust to, to customer needs. It's, it's, it's a general trend and banking cannot be uh, isolated from that broad trend. You know, Philippe, I'm wondering, is the banking industry then, given all these challenges, is the banking industry being lulled into maybe a false sense of security? Since most banks, as I mentioned earlier, are, are still very profitable, attrition appears to be low, and the market share of any single fintech is really not that significant. Is, is, there, is there a concern here that it, it may not just feel broken so that chain by itself is being ignored? It might seem like a contradiction in terms. On one hand, we see fundamental disruptive trends 
new entrants, disruptive models, incredible valuation uh, for pure play, uh, non-banks in the financial sector. And at the same time, we see indeed high profit uh, within banks because customer base is fairly sticky. And it's a bit like a restaurant. Uh, they will die with, with their last customers. In the meantime, there's a fundamental shift that is, uh, uh, that is happening in, um, in the marketplace. That, they are, however, telltale sign. These very profitable banks are currently trading at a discount. Today, their market cap is less than net tangible book, which means that the market is basically saying you will be worth tomorrow less than you are worth today. So there's a contrast between where the market views the value creation potential of the entity and where short-term accounting reported profits that basically hide the inability for banks to compete successfully and profitably uh, in the years to come. You know, you meant, as you just mentioned, the market valuation of traditional banking organizations has been hammered as of late. Is the answer to this problem, as is seen in the United States right now, increased M&A or retreating from a mission of market share dominance to being more of a specialized big banking model. You know, as I mentioned, in the United States, we're seeing a lot of organizations combine, but they're not combining to be the big five or the big six. Really, they're just combining to be bigger. Is that the answer or should they be specializing more? Why would you want to buy legacy assets, even at the discount, when the market will discount you more? The, the fundamental issue is that universal banking model has run its course. It has run its course because it, the uh, capital requirements have changed. We've seen um, the bells brackets, we've seen the money centers having to pull out of many geographies because the inability to earn their cost of capital um, based on new regulatory, but also shareholder expectations. And also a, a required a hard look at the different businesses they are in. So we will see not an increased M&A activity to reach scale, but to refocus their portfolio. So the path forward is basically pick your battle, choose the customers, the, the, the lines of business, the capabilities, the technology to and create alignment rather than increase size for the sake of size. Because honestly, when the break at value of financial institutions is greater than market cap, we know what happens. The M&A is, is more selling, you know, at the uh, at at the premium pieces uh, that you bought at a discount. You know, it's interesting, Juan, because when we look at the whole M and A model, it l continues to look at like the financial institutions are just trying to become more efficient. They're not really changing the way they serve customers. They're really saying, can we deliver our products cheaper than we did before? But you're not going to get down to the cost basis of what a digital organization can do. So. When you look at this and you look in the dynamic of, let's say, the big tech firms, what do you see as the ultimate impact of firms like Apple, Google, Amazon, and others on the overall financial services landscape and even more around the idea of efficiency and customer experience? In my view, we need to, to break apart banks in, in two, at least two very different types of businesses. One is transaction processing which is a scale or efficiency business. So when you are recording transactions, the only way to differentiate is to, to record them more, more cheaply than, than your competitors. Okay, that, that, that's one business. Then there's another business, which is credit and then risk taking. And risk taking, you, 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 cannot, you do not go with the cheapest uh, risk analyst, but with the best risk analyst. Okay, and, and risk analysis, risk analysis, sorry, is built around better understanding of uh, uh, the person or the, the institution that is asking for credit. And those are completely different businesses. Now, uh, the uh, uh, big techs have a, an advantage on both sides, but for different reasons. They have extremely efficient platform, extremely efficient pl platforms. So an Amazon is able to, to record a transaction for much less then the cheapest bank is able to, to record and they have an advantage on the cost processing. But also they understand the customers so much better than banks. The, the big techs have been able, Google, Amazon, Facebook, to, to know the customers in a much deeper way than any bank is able to. Because, because banks uh, only record the, the uh, financial transactions 
but uh, with these other guys, we are we are telling them our lives, and someone looking at our lives is much more able to find the sweet spots on on who needs uh, resources, who is able to repay their resources, and the which circumstances and the like. You have to see companies like like Stripe to to take an example. They are extremely efficient on on payment processing, but at the same time, they are building such a wealth of knowledge on the customers that they will be able to provide credit in a much more efficient way than any of the traditional banks. That, that's why you think that technology is attacking on, on, from two fronts, and it's extremely difficult for, for a traditional bank to defend itself with this uh, view on we are more efficient, uh, we are bigger, we have the license, and that's not enough. So, so Philippe, you know, as we mentioned here, the biggest delta between a traditional bank operating model and a fintech firm is is probably efficiency, but it's also the ability to know the customer in a segmented way or in the big tech world in the in a global way. When you look at the efficiency deficit and the customer awareness or or understanding the customer deficit of many of the traditional financial institutions. How did the bank or credit union address this difference? You're quite right to say that um, traditional banks have lost contact with their own customers. They have actually spent, as you know, decades trying to get customers out of their of their branches without necessarily having a, a means of maintaining that uh, that customer intimacy. Uh, today, when you're buying a financial product, you go online, check with the community go and be informed and your buying decisions is made outside of the uh, distribution network or physical network. They are therefore saddled with a very high transaction cost, uh, whether you know they, they write it off, whether they, they uh, depreciate over time, the transaction remains high. The, the, the challenge will be for the fintech on the other hand, as uh, Juan highlighted, is how do I go from being a category killer that is having extraordinary capabilities in one particular narrow product, usually globally, and then um, have the right cross-sale and, and business revenue model that is that makes sense, both on the technology capabilities, but also from a customer uh, perspective, without falling into the trap of, of, of legacy banks, which is trying to be all things to all people. Where Where is the balance? It's essentially a balance around uh, the mitigating point of serving your customer better. And as one mentioned, uh, not necessarily the cheapest price wins. Uh, you really have to look at all the dimensions of customer experience. So if, if the credit union were to fight back, it would have to be first on client intimacy and buying time the way most legacy banks have done with digital, all they've done is to basically have a, an app that allows you to check your balance and make payment, but you really don't have a digital uh, interaction or distribution model. Um, and as a result, the cost of acquiring a customer or the cost of serving a customer actually went up instead of, uh, of, of, of dropping. So to answer your question, I think as always, the starting point has to be the customer. Uh, gain through intimacy, leverage your existing um, assets, which is your distribution, and try to accelerate the technology transformation to lower your cost. Uh, it's it's uh, walking on the tightrope, but it, it's, it's, it's possible. The faster you do it, I think the, um, for those that uh, have tapped the capital markets will be rewarded by the right valuation. So Philippe and Juan, the entire concept of digital transformation is still relatively undefined for many organizations, despite the massive amount of discussion on this subject. We talked about before the podcast the fact that even the thought of being a digital bank is sometimes completely misdefined. To be prepared for the future, where do you both feel organizations need to start? I'll start with you, Philippe. Organization must first start with strategy. It's all about defining the choices uh, where to pick the battles and therefore align the rest of the organization and assist squarely with the leadership team, uh, be the C-suite and, and, and the board. That has to be the starting point. Secondly, you have to live within your means in the existing situation rather than dreaming. Most people have a pretty good idea of what the point of arrival might look like. They have far less idea of how to navigate between where they are and where they need to, to end. And therefore, 
trying, testing, being agile, not being afraid to uh, uh, to fail, but quickly adapt is is one of the models that has that has worked well. But it starts with strategy. It starts with knowing where you want uh, to fight, how to pick your battles, and what will be the basis of competition. So, um, Juan, from your perspective, is the ability to compete for a bank or credit union defined by size, or is it something else? In other words, can any organization, any size or organization, succeed and be future ready for competing as we go forward? I believe any size of organization may probably compete in the future, provided they choose where to compete. So it's it's. I don't mm-hmm. see a, a fully a, a full stack kind of organization with with all functions, uh, the production, the distribution, the marketing, uh, all, all the functions uh, run by a single entity. We are saying that there can be very efficient organizations, very nimble organizations that focus only on customer engagement, and there, there you don't need to be a huge organization, but rather focus on, on, on the segments that, that you want to cover. You can be a specialist on products. You can you can be other forms of, of uh, uh, distribution that, that become a, a partner to, to third parties in, in, in different uh, size and shapes. So there are functions that will become, I guess, uh, more and more scale dependent. Anything that goes in back offices. So back offices that provide no differentiation, only cost, that probably goes to, to, to a, long, a long way down the, the scale business. But everything that has to do with, with specialist products, with the segments of customers, there you can be a very small, uh, efficient player, and you don't need to cover everything for everyone. As Philip uh, mentioned before, it's not that you can be universal bank, uh, a small universal bank and succeed. That, that, that it's a, uh, an oxymoron. We, we believe that, that the, the universal bank model has uh, run its course, and uh, now we will see the emergence of different types of players with different uh, skills and, and capabilities to compete, size not being essentially one of them. So, Juan, sticking with you, how important it is, is it for leaders and entire organizations to have a challenger mindset? the ability to act quickly, invest efficiently, and actually embrace the change that's in front of us rather than trying to ignore it. We believe that it's not only the ability to to face change, but also to remember where you come from. So we we call this ambidexterity. You need to be able to be adaptive, to be able to exploit what change offers, but, uh, but also you need to be able to, to leverage uh, the existing assets you have and provide services very efficiently. So uh, it's not that, that you need to be either or. So not very effective in, in innovation, which can open some roads, but once the market mature or they, that uh, a specific uh, service that you're providing matures, then you need to, to be able also to provide that in a very efficient manner. Right. Because banking uh, is an extremely competitive business. Uh, banking not only the traditional banks, but with the new entrants, it's, it's becoming ex- extremely competitive. So you need to have both abilities in, inside, this ability to, to explore innovation and to be very efficient providing services. Uh, don't forget, uh, don't put all your eggs in the, in the innovation adaptability basket. You need also to be extremely efficient. So Philippe, when you look globally at organizations in the financial services area, what organizations kind of excite you because you think, guys, they're, they're kind of getting it right, both from a scale and a speed and a customer-focused perspective? What organizations in any country right now are, are maybe not getting it right, but on the right path to getting it right? Who will be among legacy players first and what we'll think in terms of, uh, of, of, of the new entrants? Because I believe that it, the challenge resides as much with the new model so-called fintech or, or digital model as uh, it resides with, um, with legacy banks. One cannot fail to be impressed with a bank like JP Morgan. And the reason why I mention that is that they have really started by first picking that battle. Uh, if you look at their revenue model, domestically, they are in some businesses, but they don't necessarily pursue that universal banking model geographically. It's basically a capital market firm internationally and it's, and it's uh, a corporate bank uh, with a bit of retail for for balance sheet reasons in in, in North America. Uh, secondly, they have embraced technology in a massive 
manner uh, to embed capabilities, but also building alliance. I think it's an interesting example because it's the largest bank and they've managed to, to reach the scale. Uh, on the other uh, side of the spectrum, we've seen some banks being challenged. Um, uh, if we look at, uh, at market cap as an indicator, uh, we see, for instance, a, a Deutsche Bank is, is really being challenged, trying to uh, find its roots. Uh, strategically, they went from guardrail to guardrail over the past uh, 10, 15 years. And now they're trying to find their, their, their new um, strategic point of arrival. On the uh, new models, ultimately, uh, what we see is the race for customer acquisition only as a driver of value creation will not necessarily be sufficient. You cannot in financial services simply play the Chinese money game by playing the valuation increase to avoid dilution. At one point in time, the increased number of customers has to be has to translate into income and profit. And we've seen some of that faltering happening with the Robin Hoods of the world, etc. But if you get it right, then a Stripe, as uh, Juan mentioned, uh, is executing, you know, so well um, uh, on their payment, but also now on their treasury products, building on their core capabilities. Again, picking their battles and, and focusing uh, uh, very well on uh, where to play and how to win. Is there any neo bank out there that is a new player in the banking arena that is seeming to get it right? Is there any neo bank that's going to be able to be similar to a traditional bank, not from a global standpoint and not even maybe across all product lines, but is there any organization that you see kind of doing it pretty well right now? Uh, forecasting is difficult, especially when you talk about the future. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few banks, the neo banks that seem to be doing it uh, right. Uh, new bank in, in Latin America, for one, yep. seems to be going the, the right way. Uh, Starling Bank in the UK, smaller one, but seems to be working in, in the right direction. Uh, N26 has moved fast and is retreating a little bit. Uh, I think they have solid foundations, but, uh, but the, the, the jury is still out. So those seem to be kind of the uh, um, full banks, uh, in, uh, reinvented banks, uh, in a way. Uh, I will look more, more into uh, providers of specific services like, like payments, and there's a lot of yep. change in the payment space now. Um, uh, uh, Stripe seems to be a winner, but uh, there's, we will see the emergence of what happens with, with, uh, with the new forms, and uh, what Apple is doing is, is intriguing, so that, that may change the paradigm there. Uh, the, the, those to me are, are the kind of, of companies. I like very much very uh, small niche players like Oak North in the UK who provide uh, very specific services for, for SMEs, those kind of things. That, that's why when you ask me, is scale the only way to play? I think no, there, there's, there's, there's ways to play without being a full scale, fully fledged bank and then being able to provide good Correct. returns to your shareholders Correct. And, and good services to your customers which I think is essential to, 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 to reach uh, uh, the, the, that level of valuation that we're talking about. You know, it's interesting, we, we talk also about open banking quite a bit. Are there any organizations that you see right now, and I'm not talking about maybe the ones who are trying to make the super app platform, but are there any organizations that seem to be doing well in the open banking environment outside of China? Well, when we, let's define open banking. The uh, modest definition is the ability for a customer to consolidate their different statements and, and the, the, the host bank have access to other banks, uh, you know, uh, statements. However, that doesn't really address the core of open banking. Ultimately, the real open banking is embedded finance and, and the non-banks there have a huge advantage. Why? Because they're driving the client relationship. And one cannot fail to see how well an Amazon or Alibaba have done in capturing every possible financial flows, uh, both uh, on a, a B2C, B2B, and B2, uh, B2C. So really capturing absolutely every part of the financial flows. I, I would say that, that you have players like Cross River, 
providing back-end services. They, they are leveraging the open banking model for their advantage. So uh, when you think about open banking, everyone thinks about customer facing. But if someone's doing customer facing, has, someone has to do the, the operations in the back. And uh, so there's, there's a space of opportunity for people such as uh, the Bank Corp or, or, or Cross River who, who provide back-end services and who are, in my view, are building an effective way to, 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 to think about open platform, uh, open banking. Or you have companies like Plaid uh, who are creating a new space by, by they're not a bank, but they have so much information about each customer that, that they can provide a level of intimacy that no non existing entity can provide. So open banking is, is, is I think, much richer than the, the pure separation of, of front to back. It, it, when you break something, you create new opportunities for, for smart players to, to leverage the, the holes that appear in, in, in the cheese. Yeah. Now, do you see a, a potential for brand new revenue models coming out of the open banking environment where you'll be able to get revenue from third party providers that want to have access to specific customer sets? Is, is, is banking looking at this not as globally as they should, not globally from a geographic standpoint, but from an overall product standpoint, are uh, they not aware of the fact that there there can be significant revenue opportunities and new ways to build revenue models? We, we have seen a couple of examples uh, of banks uh, or entities, not banks, but rather new entrants, thinking about subscription models, yeah. uh, which which are intriguing, but there's definitely a way to, to, to think about them. About them. Uh, there could be advertising uh, support models, uh, definitely, when you have information about the customers, uh, there's ways to, to leverage advertising embedded or, or intertwined with, with, with other services. Yeah. So there's definitely new players who are thinking about new ways to interact with, with the customer yeah. uh, in a way that uh, banks uh, have not traditionally thought of because they they were very uh, focused on on a specific transactions. Right. Uh, so, I charge you for your credit for your uh, checking account, or for check check processing, or for whatever. Or, and then I, I charge you money for for the spread between uh, the, the the price I get money from and the, the price I lend you money to. Uh, so, there, there's many ways that are emerging. Uh, many of them linked to to e-commerce platforms who who have uh, rethought. Uh, value for the customer and uh, and have started to to push around these new models at the most holistic level the big change is that banking was defined by the regulators in uh, comparisonalized business lines today banking has become a transversal capability that cuts across every economic sectors uh, every business uh, that used to be um, at arm's length. Today, we see that uh, that convergence, and that uh, creates opportunities, as Juan mentioned, that did not exist uh, before. You know, Philippe, when you look at where banks and credit unions are today, traditional banks and credit unions, and you look at how much change has to take place, how important are third-party alliances and partnerships to be able to get up to speed, to get up to, to the scale quick enough. How important is this to the potential for success? I think it's absolutely critical. Uh, and in fact, it is one of the key advantages of technology. It allows you to integrate different parties into a coherent delivery model. Uh, the advantage is twofold. Number one, for the ones who execute well, um, a, a vast, a uh, part of their cost uh, structure will become variable as opposed to fixed. And secondly, uh, they will benefit on the portfolio scale of the service or product provider, which means that new entrants can, from day one, be at scale on a unit cost, um, be it you know, because they have so many customers and they have scale, or they basically a variable cost because they'll pay per customer or per transaction. So absolutely critical. So it's interesting. Uh, when I picked up your book and, and read it, what I liked was, I liked a lot of things about it, but one thing I thought, thought was really interesting was at the end of the book, 
you provided 11 questions that financial institutions should ask themselves to determine if they're future ready. Is there one question, I'll ask this of both of you, is there one question that stands out as being, this, this is the one that probably is key. This is the one that's probably more important than the rest. I think the, 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 the first one really has to, to do around the choices around customers and, and markets and, and models. Uh, this is where I think the biggest mistakes, uh, the, where the, the value at stake is the highest and where people are afraid of saying uh, no to many and yes to very few uh, opportunities. So all the questions pertaining to where to play uh, requires diligence, courage, leadership, and organizational alignment. Boy, that's good. How about how about you, Juan? What what was your question that you thought, boy, this is this it may not be the most important, but it's certainly a doggone important from the standpoint of understanding if it's gonna hold you back or not. My favorite one is is question number ten. Are you willing to set aside your corporate ego? Uh, because many times we, we when we discuss these topics with, with banks, with bank executives, not with banks, uh, but with bank executives, uh, the first thing we, we get Oh, but these guys were competing against, they are not banks. So what? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. But then if they are banks, but, but they are monoliners and they, they are not. So it's kind of a, from a position of, of superiority. Uh, they Bank executives tend to, to have a disdain for, for these new entrants, which I believe is the weakest link in, in their defense strategies. If you don't recognize that there is change coming uh, against you, it's very difficult that that you will start the process uh, and that Philip was mentioning of rethink your strategy, take the courage to make changes, look for the, the, the leaders that will be in place to, to run the game. Uh, there's no danger and, and Jim you were asking it once and uh, many times over. We are making good money. Who should, why should we worry about it? It's, uh, we are fine. That's uh, to me that that's the weak uh, point that they should address. You know, it's interesting. You, uh, Philippe earlier mentioned Chase and, and J.P. Morgan Chase. I think it's interesting to see what they're doing right now and even more interesting to see how Jamie Dimon is not only educating his bank, but educating the investor public to say, you know what, we have to pay attention to these other players. We need to do things differently than we've ever done them before. And, and this most recent battle, we need to invest much more in research and development and in innovation at a time when shareholders usually just expect those earnings to be rolled back into their pockets as opposed to into the research and development area. You know, it's, it's what really stood out between what I'm used to in the United States and what I saw in China was the commitment to R&D across the board. Right. You know, when we talk about disruption, your book, Disruption, really does a great job of discussing what the financial institutions have to do to make their future more likely to be successful. How do my listeners get a hold of your book, Philippe? It's available online and um, it has been uh, well received by uh, the major um, critics. So I encourage people to read. I think it's a, it's a great read. We're simply trying to um, help readers pause and think for themselves. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, uh, as you highlighted. It's a number of questions at the end, uh, but hopefully it, it will help uh, everyone um, think and look at disruption and transformation differently. You know, it's interesting. It, it, I like the book, The Way It Was Structured, because it really laid out what the problems were, how fintech organizations are addressing these problems in many cases better than legacy financial institutions. You know, as I talk about on my podcast and in my webinars and such, sometimes I tend to want to make the client or the listening audience sick before I make them well. You do this in your book and you also provide a lot of guidance as to Every organization can have to look at these situations differently. There's not just one answer. But I think what's interesting is the 11 questions in the back of your book really have a wake-up call to organizations and say, here's how you identify if you're sick. 
Here's how I identify if you're not being aware of what's around you. And here's how to identify the potential and the opportunities out there. Thank you both for being on the show today. I really appreciate our time together. Great being on the show. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take 30 to 45 seconds to give us a review on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us to get the kind of guests we have today. Finally, be sure to catch my articles on the financial brand and check out the research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Rule Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Kim Roos. Until next time, remember, as Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase stated, incumbent banks should be scared shitless of fintech rivals. Oh,